So we're, I'm going to have two talks in a row here. First, I'm going to talk about the taver valves that are here and the taver valves that are coming and my conflicts that I'm involved with a number of the TAVR trials. So there's two valves that are FDA approved right now. There's the Sapien S3 valve and there's the Medtronic Evolute and Evolute Pro valves. Uh, the, the Sapien is a balloon expandable valve. It's a cobalt chromium frame with a bovine pericardial valve in it, and it's that, and they've added a skirt to it. The Evolute and Evolute Pro are a nitinol frame with a porcine pericardial valve in it, and the Pro added a skirt. So Sapien S3 is the third generation of the Sapien family. Evolute is the second generation of the Medtronic family, and Evolute Pro is the third generation. Now we're going to start with the Evolute family. It started off as a core valve. A core valve was also a nitinol frame. The frame was a little bit different. It coned down to the bottom, and it was a, a, a cone all the way down, so that the largest diameter was actually at the bottom. The Evolute actually flattened this out and changed the engineering of the nitinol so that the radial force across the area of interference that you wanted was more constant. It didn't go up as you got smaller and didn't drop off as you got up to the upper ends. And then what we did for the Pro is we added a pericardial wrap to fill in more space. When we first were designing this valve, I thought for sure just adding a little pericardium wouldn't help with PVL, but it helped tremendously. And it's because if you really look at it from an engineering standpoint, it increases your surface of contact by eight times. Now, just again, as you go out and read these studies, and we'll talk about the studies in a minute, you have to understand which studies were first generation, second generation, third generation valves. The Sertavi intermediate risk, which just finished for Medtronic, was basically a first generation valve. 84% of the valves were core valve and only 16% were the Evolute valves. By the time we moved to continue to access, we're now on to 93% uh, second generation valves. Now we talked about access. You can see right now it, in the trial it was almost 96% access. And for the last three years, we're running a 98% transdermal access here, 98%. It's very close to 100%. A little bit of clinical outcomes. We're going to do this in the second one, so I'm not going to talk a lot about it right now. But in the third generation valves, you look at the uh, continued access, uh, second generation valves, continued access, 275 patients, average age over 79, mortality zero, major stroke rate 0.4%, and pacemaker rate 16%. If as a surgeon I could do 275 straight 79 year old AVRs with a zero mortality at a 0.4% stroke rate, they would carry me around the hospital on their shoulders. Now, we always worry about paravalvular leak, but this is for the third generation valve, Evolute Pro. At one year, 90% none to trace and 10% mild. That looks like a surgical valve. And it covers the widest range of, of, of uh, analysis that are out there. And there's a new valve coming on the, on the horizon, and it's going to be called the Horizon Valve. And it's a little bit different because it's going to expand radially, and you're going to be able to deploy this valve to full deployment assess the valve. If you like it, let it go. If you don't like it, you can actually pull it back in and move it or put a new valve in. So instead of deploying like we do with the core valve in Evolute to two-thirds and letting it go and hoping it lands in the right place, this one will deploy to 100%. So you'll never get it wrong, ever. And then we move on to Sapien and Centura. These are the Edwards valves. The Sapien family has been approved by the FDA. It started with the Sapien, which was a cobalt chromium frame and, and bovine pericardium XT. They, ch they changed the frame a little bit. Uh, and then at Sapien 3, they actually added a skirt to that, and they made the cells a little bit bigger at the top for coronary access. And they have a new one coming out, which would be called the Ultra, which has an actually higher skirt to try to cut down on paravalve leak more. And of course, they still are planning future valves with this. Centura is Edward's self-expanding valve. It's an intraannular self-expanding valve. The first uh, data has come from Anson's place up in Vancouver, and the data looks pretty good. But it's in its early testing phase. The Ultra is going to be interesting because not only is it going to have a higher skirt, but it's going to come preloaded. Right now, when we use a Sapien valve, we have to assemble the valve in the descending aorta. It's not a big deal, but you know it adds 30 seconds to your workday. If 30 seconds matters, the Ultra won't need that at all. You're just going to put it in and, and, and deploy it. It's also going to have a little bit nicer nose comb for crossing, and the delivery systems, the delivery handles get better and better all the time. Centura, as I said, is a self-expanding valve. And it's actually got a motorized handle. It's designed to be implanted by one person. Right now we have two people, but you can see where this field is going. As a surgeon, if you're not involved now, when it gets down to one person, don't count on being there. The other valve that's been tested and the data has been presented is the Lotus valve by Boston. It is the third type of valve out there. So we have a balloon expandable valve, a self-expanding valve, and this is a mechanically expanded valve. It's a single nitinol wire with a bovine pericardial valve in it and a polytetrafloral skirt. And what happens is this valve expands out, it's extruded out to its normal length, and there's a buckle and a post at the top connected by a wire, and you turn the handle, these two come together until they lock like a seatbelt. And as you shorten something, what happens? It widens out. 
So this valve, you actually it's got kind of the, the, the best of both worlds. It has more radial force like a balloon valve, but it can be recaptured and redeployed like a self-expanding valve. This valve you can deploy to its completely in position, in lock position. You can stop and look at the valve and decide if you like it. If you like it, you let it go. If you don't like it, you unlock it and you put in a new valve. So it has some, some very interesting uh, 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 advantages to it. Now right now, these, the pins that hold it in place, when they changed a new delivery system, the edge system, the manufacturing was a little off and we had some pins that came loose. They actually stopped the use of this valve right now. They're, they're redesigning that. We thought we were going to have it out earlier this year. It's probably going to be in about another two months. And it'll come out with some of the new delivery systems. But this valve has already been tested. The, device, the data has already been published. I suspect this will be the next valve that's approved by the FDA. There's a very good body of knowledge on this. It was tested against the uh, core valve and the Evolute valve is, in this trial is about half core valve, half Evolute, and the composite primary safety endpoint was exactly the same as the approved valve. So again, I really do expect this valve to be approved. Next generation will have an easier delivery system. It's more flexible. The original delivery system was fairly stiff. This will cause less, uh, less push against the septum and the AV node. And the markers that we, that we used to, to know when these things came together and locked, which used to be hard to see for an old 65-year-old guy like me. For a young guy like Neil, it was easy, but for me, it was hard. They'll be, they'll be uh, more radio opaque, and it'll be easier to see when it, when it locks. We used to have to move to several positions to make sure it's locked. The new locking system won't require that. You'll be able to see it in one position. It's simplifying the procedure. And this is the old valve on top. You see how it extrudes? We're extruding to its normal length, and it's pushing it down in the LVOT. And then once it gets there, then we shorten it up by, by pulling these things together. Now, the problem with that is you shoved it into the LVOT, the left ventricular outflow tract, and then you pulled it back. And there was a high pacemaker rate. Who would know if you shove stuff in the LV, it would cause a high pacemaker rate? Of course it caused a high pacemaker rate. And on the bottom is depth guard. <coughs> and depth guard is different because it's designed to shorten as it extrudes so it never goes in the LVOT. And people like Chris Maduri and, 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 uh, and Vivek Rajpal at uh, Piedmont have already used this and have shown that their pacemaker rates have now dropped down to about 13%. So again, the advantages as you go across this, they're gonna, the, the valve being deployable to 100% is going to stay. That's going to be great. Um, and the delivery system, which was a little clunky, is getting better all the time. And of course, they too have a new valve coming out, the Mantra valve. And it's going to be a smaller delivery system, shorter valve, and come in more sizes. Portico, Portico is another self-expanding valve. It is an intra-annular self-expanding valve, whereas Evolute and Evolute Pro are super annular uh, valves. Uh, this valve uh, is designed with slightly bigger uh, uh, diamonds in the nitinol. That's to allow any calcium to get beyond the nitinol and against the pericardium so that it will seal. And this trial is done. The data is not presented, but it should come out next year. And I suspect this will be the fourth valve that gets approved in the US if the data is good. It too has a very robust system of evidence. It's already CE marked in Europe, just like the Lotus valve. I think the next one we're probably gonna see in the US is gonna be the accurate Neo valve. This was just bought by Boston Scientific. It is too is a self-expanding valve. It is super annular, but it deploys in a unique way. When you deploy it, what you do is you get it in position, you deploy the top crown first, and that top crown actually stabilizes it, and then you deploy the lower crown. So there's less movement as you put this valve in. It also has some little feelers that help you get against the top of the valve, so it helps you get the right positioning every time. One of the interesting things about this valve is that it has a very low pacemaker rate. So as you go into lower risk people and younger people, having a pacemaker becomes more and more of an issue. If you're 80 years old and you get a pacemaker, that's not too big a deal. If you're 60 and get a pacemaker and you gotta live with it for 30 years, that's a bigger deal to you. The Jenna valve is, is already approved in Europe, and it trial should start hopefully sometime this year. We're talking to the Jenna people right now. It's an interesting valve, and it has these little feelers, and these little feelers go down into the sinuses, and this is how it works. And what this does is two things. One is it helps you always get the valve aligned in the, in the right position. If you look at regular ta taver valves, they don't align commissure to commissure. It's a random orientation, whereas this always aligns the right way because you're choosing the sinuses. And it's the only valve that's actually approved for use in AI. AI is always hard because there's no calcium to hang on. It's hard to get your valve where you want it. Whereas this one, you put it in there, those little feelers actually clip the old leaflet to the valve. And so for AI, this tends to be a pretty good valve. So these are next in line to be approved in the US. I think there are some other ones making rapid progress. The Jenna valve, the Centura valve, the Venus A valve is developed in China. 
Um, I think Venus A is Chinese for core valve, but uh, that's how it works over there. And the other interesting things that we're working on now is tissue engineered valve. I actually tried to sell this idea about six or seven years ago and I, I couldn't get anybody interested. But what you do is you take this uh, different type of matrix. This particular one is a uh, bioabsorbable supermolecular polymer that's electro spun out there and you mount it on a nitinol frame. My idea was always to put it on a nitinol frame and then put it up in your thoracic aorta and leave it for three months and let your body become your bio cedar. And then recapture it like you recapture an inferior vena cava filter, turn it around and put it in there because most people don't need emergency aortic valve surgery. You can plan this ahead and actually custom design a valve that's right for you. And these have been put in sheep with really good success. So as we move into younger and younger people, the hope is in 10 years, we'll be able to put in a bio-designed valve made for you that's seeded with your own endogenous cells and hopefully live as long as your valve lives. So this is the global landscape. These are the, the people that are the current leaders. And I haven't even talked about these other people. This is a multi-billion dollar industry. So as you might imagine, there's a list of valves, and this actually isn't, if, you know, since this list was put together about a month ago, this list is no longer current. There's so many people working on this. So these are kind of the future contenders that are gonna, that are gonna come forward. So when we look at Tavern 2018, the Tavern technology has dramatically evolved, really focusing on user-friendly, lower profile systems. That's why we're at 98% transfemoral right now, with more precise valve positioning. In the early days, these valves were bouncing all around and you know, you'd start pacing the heart and everybody would go into a moment of shock and panic while you deployed the valve. And if it landed in the right place, everybody high-fived. And if it landed in the wrong place, well, you know, the early days of Taver had a 50% mortality. Not 30 days, 30 minutes. Either it worked perfectly or you failed tremendously. That rarely happens anymore. And we're really working on reducing the major issues such as paravalve or leak and the major complications like coronary obstruction, anus or aortic rupture, and pacemaker. Of, the, of these, the only one that's real kind of bothersome is still the pacemakers. We see almost no coronary obstruction, almost no annular rupture, almost no aortic rupture. The complications have gone way down. Now, one of the controversies for your program would be how many TAVR systems you need. You know, surgeons, like cardiologists, like toys. Now, I take every system you give me. The problem is, is it's really hard to learn more than about three systems. And if you're not doing several hundred a year, you're not even going to learn two systems. And so it's going to be hard to figure out which ones you want to keep on the shelf. There is no perfect TAVR system. The design optimization has trade-offs. So if you put on an external cuff to reduce PVL, you add to the profile, and you may add to the pacemaker rate. The Sapien 3 pacemaker rate went up from the Sapien XT pacemaker rate. Not hugely, and some of it was implantation, but there is a cuff there. And there are really strong subjective opinions about which one you should use and which thing is most important. I often get asked, if somebody does a lot of this, to, to talk about which valve is best. And I always tell people, asking me to stand in public and say which valve is best would be asking me to stand in public in front of my daughters and say which daughter is prettiest. There is no answer that's not going to get me in trouble. They all have different pros and cons to them. And significant operating experience, again, if you, don't, if you aren't really doing two or three hundred a year, it's going to be hard to learn more than three systems. And future TAVR systems really should be expected to treat all patients, especially lower risk patients and bicuspid aortic valve patients, which have been an exclusion up to this point. And a customized approach considering each patient's anatomy and clinical factors with particular attention to avoiding major complications. Right now, I'm, I'm, I've got a paper that's going to be on at the AATS looking at the causes and timing of death in the randomized intermediate Sirtavi trial. And most of the deaths in the highest instantaneous hazard risk for both surgery and TAVRs in the first 30 days around the procedure. And what kills TAVR patients? Technical complications. The valve ends in the wrong place or you perforate the heart. Those are very solvable problems. Surgery? It was the complications such as renal failure, pulmonary failure. Those become a little harder to deal with. And ultimately, regional availability and economic factors will be strong determinants. And, you know, probably 7 to 80% will be performed equally well by any of the systems that you want to have out there. I think it's interesting when you think about TAVR as opposed to surgery, surgery is a technical skill. Technical skills take 10,000 hours to be a master. It's hard to learn. TAVR is technology. Technology you can, you, can, you can manage a lot quicker. A good example was Dr. DeBakey coming to Allen about putting in a graft and descend aorta. If I take you in to have you do an open descend aorta and you've never done one, I can stand there with you, even if it's a good neck, and you're going to have a hard time. If I take you into a descending thoracic aorta that has a good neck and take a, taver, uh, take a TVAR va uh, graft up there and show you where to put it and say, now pull the string, you're a master already. This will actually allow more people to have access to good care where they don't have good surgeons. Thank you very much. Thank you.